Even Fancier Drinking by Internet Historian. Brought to you by Incogni. All right, we've done theater, we've done painting, we've done wine, and now it's time to do some drinking stuff in general. Yeah. And to start, let us learn about the drinking cultures of the world. It'll be a good one. That's how you know. Just immediately in the Welcome drinking. to my private jet. Come on, kid. I got a lot to teach you about the world. <laughs> we must learn all of the drinking customs of all the funny foreign places. Starting with where drinking was invented. The country of Uck. Uck. <laughs> the trick is to jump just before you hit the ground. Observe British people in their natural habitat. Here they do a thing called cheers, uh -huh. where they clink their glasses together before drinking. Cheers. The tradition dates back centuries, but the origin, why they started doing it, is somewhat unknown. But we have a couple of theories. This is such a human thing, though. Why do humans do this? I don't know. It's kind of started one day. What, what do you mean it just kind of started one day? I, I don't know what you want from me. Sometimes humans just do things. So we, we don't know why. Sometimes we develop little just th like, like, How did Gat come around, right? <laughs> just happened one day, okay? Just don't question it. Theory one. Poisoning. Yeah. Yes. So imagine a situation like this. Two people who don't trust each other sitting down together at the pub. This guy then does something shady to the other guy's drink. Here you go. Did you poison my drink? Me? I would never. Well then, I'll pour a little of mine into yours and you can pour a little of yours into mine and we'll both either be totally fine or both totally dead. No, no, there's, there's no need to do that. So that was the initial version. And mm -hmm. then eventually they just kind of shortcutted it to, yeah, clink, clink, it's fine, I trust you. I just, it depends on the poison. It depends if it's a heavier one, depends if it dissolves faster. Uh, there are certain toxins today that I don't think would necessarily even be affected by this. But I could I can see the logic in especially of the period, if this was a concern, if this was a worry, and it was a known practice to pour into each other's drinks, that I could see this being an evolution. But if we don't have any documentation in regards to pouring one's drink to the other, I would call this speculation at best. But that's probably a myth. So, theory number two. Ghosts. Yeah. Right, in the Middle Ages, people were worried about spooky ghosts and spirits. So they do cheers very loudly to scare away the demons. Also, sometimes you'd spill some of your drink onto the table and the floor, and then that was like a little offering to the spirit. But that's probably also not true. The so. most likely answer is simply that everyone likes that sound. Yeah. Ah, uh, very satisfying. There's more. You know, honestly, my take on that, it makes the funny noise. People like the funny noises. There is people a lot of the times are more lizard brain than you'd think. Sometimes they'll do uh, what is it, the, the, the funny little door stopper, the one that you play with and you you flick and it goes right. That one. Why do we do it? It makes the funny noise. Sometimes that is all the justification required. When someone drops a glass and everyone goes kind of silent like, oh, you fucking idiot. <laughs> well, in the UK, instead, everyone goes, way in celebration. As a way to make fun of you, but also make you feel not so bad. Uh-oh. The BBC. They have a whole organization for that now. Oh, whoa. We gotta get out of here. We'll take my private cruise ship. Come, come to Italy, where they filmed the Mario movie. Let me just park this here. Chai, this is actually real. <laughs> Come this way to the Leaning Tower of Pizza, held up by the raw strength of a thousand tourists posing for photographs. But did you know that Italians, when they say cheers, say chin chin? Now, that is very funny to the Japanese because <laughs> in Japan. <laughs> I understand that. <laughs> Gross. But also kind of fun. <laughs> I shouldn't laugh at that. That's actually kind of great. Japanese, chin yeah. chin means penis. It, yes, it do. Germany next. Now here they do Bruderschaft, where you link your arms together when drinking. 
It's also kind of seen all over the world at weddings in particular, but right. only the Germans have a name for it. It symbolizes the end of formalities between two people. But the Germans that. have a lot more. Now, when you clink glasses together with someone, you have to look them directly in the eye. And if you don't do it, you will be cursed with seven years of bad sex. Oh no! Apparently. It's not my fault, it's the Germans. <laughs> <laughs> then when doing shots in Germany, they sometimes also go Zermit, and you hold the glass near your belly. Zertit, and you hold it near your chest. And then Zumsack, and you hold it near your, you know. And then Zack Zack, and you drink. Now, on to Finland, well, well, they keep it casual. They have a custom specifically for drinking alone. You're supposed to do it while loafing around in your underpants, and it's called Kalsari Kani, also known as underwear drunk all right that's all i could find on finland so oh. that, that, that's honestly an entire mood in itself like that that that's just a fun weekend the germans they they really go hard both in the formality and the informal <laughs> both sides of that of that wow that was excellent Off to canada to get there i booked us a private fishing trawler it's so exclusive that even these fish yes they go to a private school my god <laughs> Awful. In Newfoundland, Canada, they have the Newfoundland Screech. What? You take a shot of Screech, and then you do the Screech. Goes like this. Is you a Screecher? And then you answer like this. Deed I am, me old cock, and long me your big jib jaw. That's it. It's a pirate. I'll drink to that. Culture. Then they take a big fish, usually a cod, and Oops. they kiss it on the lips. Why can I never escape the fish? Those of you that are in the know, that I am haunted by this stupid puffer fish, and consistently I am finding just fish in things that I do. It's actually getting a little like disconcerting. Anyway, I'm kind of I'm kind of busy, so uh, there's no more customs anywhere in the world. You can do some more, maybe uh, independent research yourself. I'll, I'll see you back in the field. Nice. <laughs> And fart. <laughs> I love it. That was great. Okay, this next section is on cocktails. Nice. So it all started when we made this asset where the Irish character, he's shaking a cocktail at a frat party. And I turned to the editor and I went, wait a minute, that's a weird word. Why are they called cocktails? And we started Googling it and we kind of went down a rabbit hole and it was actually really interesting. So yeah. here it is. Okay, I'm ready. Hit me. Cocktails. In the 1700s, Fuel prices were outrageous. So, everybody used the horse. Okay. Now, horses weren't just used for travel. They were also used for work in the fields. Right. So you would sometimes put up... Those are Clydesdales, aren't they? The the big hoof ones? I hear Clydesdales are absolute just jerks. It could also be specific types Clydesdales. But I, I hear their temperament tends to be more foul. Harness on a horse for plowing a field, right? Yeah. Now, when you do that, its tail actually gets in the way. And so we have to do something about that thing. Dock it? Think of it like the foreskin of the horse. No! You put it in the guillotine and everybody closes their eyes. <laughs> Problem solved. Now, this okay. practice is called docking. Hey, I'll take that W. Thank you, Idaho Education, for random farming and agricultural facts. <laughs> you have to do the same with sheep, too. You have to do the same with a lot of farm animals because... Uh, certain uh, uh, d d d d poo -poo, <laughs> if you will, uh, that gets a little messy back there. It just makes things a lot cleaner, makes caring for the animal a lot easier as well. Not not anything weird, right? Just farming things, just agricultural things. Those of you that deal with animals or have dealt with animals know exactly what I'm talking about. <laughs> it has a different meaning these days. <laughs> so once the tail is docked, some say it's much easier to clean. But it also kind of looks like a chicken's tail, right? Yeah. Hence, kinda. they would call these tails cocktails. Interesting. So that's step one in the story. Step two. You've also got horse merchants, right? And yeah. they are a very shrewd bunch. Okay. They know that when they sell their horses, the customer wants very feisty and energetic animals. Right. Someone who's buying a horse doesn't want one that's kind of sickly or lazy or yeah. sleeping all the time, right? They need it for work. So how do you ensure, then, that your horse looks full of beans and moxie and some other stuff and has the maximum horsepower possible okay. when it's time to sell? 
Well, they would use this one quick hack. All the equestrians hate them. They would go over to their mortar and pestle, and they would throw in some chili, uh, uh, mm, oh no. some ginger, and a few other spices, and just mix it all together. Then... I keep thinking I need to get a big mortar and pestle like that. They're actually super cool to have around. I miss having one around in my kitchen. They would go over to the horse, and hold still, little no! fella, and with the mixture go up into the no-no area. <laughs> It's just a it's a spicy suppository. <laughs> you see, you can tell that I've dealt with medical personnel in my life because stuff like that makes me actually laugh. Oh my god. If you if you want some dark humor, if you want some absolute just next level memes, find yourself a doctor or a nurse or a specialist in your life. Oh my god. <laughs> it's a spicy suppository. <laughs> Now, the horse doesn't like that very much, so it's kicking, it's going mad, and the bidders are all going, wow, this is a really great horse, it's got some spunk, I tell ya, I'm buying it. Right. So the horse merchants made a whole bunch of money, and everyone was happy. Well. Except the horse. Almost everyone. The end. This actually brings up a good point. You know how we have, what is it, like the Pepper X or whatever, that's hotter than the Carolina Reaper? If there was, in fact, a Pepper X spicy suppository in this fashion, I wonder if you might go into actual shock. I'm very curious. I feel like some scientist somewhere has tested this. Well, I mean, to be fair, we have tested ants and stilts and how they actually count their steps. We, we, science is fun. I love scientists. Of step two. Now step three. Around the same time, you've got bartenders over in the saloon. And they have just invented the science of mixology. My god. They've realized that you can add Red Bull and lemon juice to stuff and actually make alcohol not taste so bad. It's wild. But when they added some ginger and spices and maybe a little bit of pepper, people went, oh, I know these. These are those horse suppositories. No. Cocktails, we'll call them. Glug, 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 glug. And the name stuck that makes sense i can see this that 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 makes a lot of sense actually that's fascinating. Think it's too early for ad time i don't think it's too early for ad time ad time oh no help me incogni man i signed up for discounts at a retail store and they won't stop sending me messages huh i signed up to that the audio on this is different i don't know if you can hear it feel free to rewind the audio in this section is different website years ago why are they still spamming me That would be my doing. I am Data Beast Man. Beast Man? Who, Who will, will stop, stop him? him? It's me, Incogni Man. I love Incogni it. is the brilliant service that tells a whole bunch of databases and people who have your data and stuff to get fucking lost. It says, hey, do you have this email address? Well, lose it. Hey, marketer man, you can't use this phone number anymore. Instead of chasing them all up manually by signing up to Incogni, they send these legal requests on your behalf to get you deleted from the internet. Let us do battle in my room. <laughs> then we teleport to the desert. I better follow him. Incogni portal. <laughs> Good of you to finally join us. Yeah, well, I'm going to stop you. Incogni lawyer powers, legal threats, data removal tools, Consumer Privacy Act, data protection regulations, polite yet stern wording. It has created a Gundam. <laughs> so go to incogni.com slash incognito. Sign up today and get 60% off an annual plan. I won't change numbers. I won't change email addresses. I'll just simply Take him back. I can feel it working. My phone isn't ringing as often. My email inbox, it's less full with uh, just a whole bunch of shit. And then like the sun, <laughs> the clouds yeah. clear. My databases are getting too light. I'm floating away. He'll die of the cold eventually. <laughs> Pan up and it's an old man. He's like, not bad kid. <laughs> Not bad at all. <laughs> so go to incogni.com slash incognito. Sign up today and get 60% off an annual plan. Add over. So I also critique these because I have uh, 
a buddy of mine who was able to deal with my audio and help address the audio. Certain things happen. Like I had issues with my DSer recently, so I've stopped using the DSer a little bit because that is an art in itself to work. Um, I did hear the uh, the the transition from the prior content into the ad read. The audio level was a little different. Not a huge fan of that. It's not uniform. There's not a whole lot you can do about that, especially in post sometimes, especially if you have certain clips coming in and maybe the normalization goes off. Like, I, there's a number of things that happen there. I'm not saying that post is easy, especially audio production. There's a reason that I will pay people if I do podcasts and stuff, 100%. Um, it was different. It was it was a different audio uh, settings, audio volume. That There was a noticeable difference for me there. I did like the insanity of this. It started with kind of a slow roll, kind of went into that insanity. I did love it. The Gundam bit was perfect. I absolutely loved that. Uh, the Nordman did feel like that was on a different audio as well, but that, you know, kind of snickering into the microphone kind of thing. Not quite. I, I like the inclusion of him. I think that's where I'll leave it. I like the inclusion of Nordman there. Uh, in the Incogni, it found like stuff like there was a couple, uh, a couple sudden uh, cuts to what was being said overall still like a nine out of 10 ad read not quite perfect that's just kind of my opinions on that i don't know i liked it though i like that it adds to the content which unfortunately not a lot of youtube does have you heard about the latest dangerous trend it's all over social media wine mixed with watermelon a, bit of a combination when mixed together makes a deadly poison here we are in Argentina with a delicious watermelon. Now let me chase it down with a glass of <gasps> wine. No. I don't think red wine would go okay, with it. Okay, it's not true. But it's been a myth in South America for over a hundred years that you uh -huh. should never pair wine and watermelon together. Really? No one quite knows why. But we dug and we dug and we were able to find a single source from an author, Facundo de Genova. And he says in probably Argentina, probably <laughs> sometime in the 1800s, okay. there was a small Catholic church and everything was great. For a time, they grew wine for dinner and watermelon for dessert. Until one day, something bad happened in their idyllic little town. A few men in the village started getting a bit uh, grabby. <laughs> Is this the Resident Evil 4 soundtrack? Oh my god, I love this. It was a whole Me Too thing, but it was the first Me Too. It was a Me One. My no god. one quite knows who did what to whom, but it was a big scandal, I tell you. Okay. And it kept happening. Oh no, what's happening to our beautiful our village? They said in their funny foreign accents. Now, presiding over the village was a monastery. So the priests all gathered together at this monastery to figure out what the hell's going on with all this grabbiness. Yeah, this uh, town uh, sucks now, said the women folk. I hope you have uh, the plan to fix uh, this. Uh, yes, of course we do. But first, we must figure out why the men are becoming so grabby. Come on, guys, uh -huh. think outside the box. We have to find something, anything to blame, except the people who actually did the thing. So the priests began looking at the diets of the people in the village. Hmm, the priest said aloud. One of the monks proposed a theory. Have you noticed that we grow a lot of grapes here? Yes. And have you noticed that we also grow a lot of watermelon? Yeah. Well, what if, you know, somehow <laughs> it makes the men folk grabby? That must be it. We must put a stop to this. But how? Well, let's tell them that if they drink wine and eat watermelon, they'll go to hell. My God. Okay. So that's what they did. Hear ye, hear ye. Do not drink wine and then eat watermelon. You'll go to hell. Oh, really? Yeah, really? Oh, really? 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 Yeah, I don't know that. Really, 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 really? And it worked. The assaults suddenly stopped. Hurrah. Although whether that was a coincidence, we don't actually know. Over time, however, the messaging kind of evolved because... Don't mix wine with watermelon isn't exactly a well-known Bible proverb, and people became less religious. So instead of, you'll go to hell, the line changed to, it's poison and you'll die. <laughs> and in Argentina, in some places, the myth still perpetuates. Now, is there actually any evidence at all that pairing wine and watermelon together really causes the mood? Kind of. Watermelon. I'm very interested in this because this is a prime example of correlation. 
or sorry, correlation being causation, or at least it being assumed as correlation being causation, when correlation can not be causation. Like that is actually a huge problem the internet has. Or oh, this thing happened, this must lead to this. So I'm huge, a huge fan of things like this when they deep dive this. And I always love looking into the science behind it and the psychology behind it in regards to how things evolve. I mean, that's just that's also just a very human thing. Don't go into the forest because I don't know. You got a bunch of druggies out there trying to trying to trying to gank each other. And over time that can evolve into don't go into the forest. There's witches in there. Don't go into the forest. There's a uh, uh, a beast man in there. And, you know, over the course of a few hundred years, right, you can see how you have an entire mythos for just a story of a forest where people were just, you know, <laughs> getting, <laughs> getting a little too uh, spicy on some substances and trying to gank each other. Right. So that is 100 percent a human thing. I actually really loved all of this segment as Resident Evil 4 is one of my like top like five favorite games of all time, especially the remake. It is God just so good. So I really did appreciate this entire segment. Contains an amino acid, arginine, which okay. partially transforms into nitric oxide. And then nitric oxide is a vasodilator okay, and vasodilators sense. uh do this. Right. Plus wine also Love has flow. polyphenols and that also helps in the formation of nitric oxide. So, Double this. Double blood flow. But the effect from nitric oxide is actually very mild. Okay. Also, all of these foods have polyphenols and arginine in them as well. Yeah. So pretty much everything has it. So, no. The effects are likely hugely overstated. Oh. So, the moral of the story is... <laughs> yeah! <laughs> God. That was... Okay, that was perfect. I absolutely... Uh, that... that that got that got me that was great and like this is why one of the best questions in life and i impart this to everybody i can ask why the sheer amount of knowledge and information and wisdom you will gain by just asking why will take you so far and that being said sometimes there is a situation where it's like well what's the moral of the story I don't know. I mean, <laughs> allegedly this happened once upon a time. You had the church saying, well, let's not do this. And potentially a forced correlation and causation happened. Cause, and this is in a vacuum. There could have been things going on in the background village politics wise. There could have been a number of things that could have happened. Sometimes it's just like, well, I mean, this kind of happened. This is an example of humans being humans. And also over time, you see, instead of going to hell, it just leads to you will be unalive, right? If you do this. Or over time, it's not necessarily unreliable narration. It's just more the, the telephone game, right? You tell you have a circle of twelve people. You tell the person on your left, you know, uh, uh, Stacy's mom has got it going on, and suddenly when it gets back to you on the other side, you're hearing Scotty doesn't know, right? You're welcome to the two thousand song, but yeah, this is very very human. This next section is on wine in the Bible. Sort of. Apologies if we got any details wrong. We mostly kept the section because we liked the pun on Eucharist. Nice. The Bible. Jumping forward to Jesus. This is his first recorded miracle. So, Jesus and a whole bunch of his followers and stuff, they are invited to a wedding in Cana. Now, the waiter goes over to serve some guests some wine and. Uh oh. Oh, the it's water. Empty. What do you mean it's empty? There's no more wine. <laughs> no, wait, I've got a plan, says Jesus. Bring me six big stone jugs, about 20 to 30 <laughs> gallons each, and fill them up to the brim with H2O. Now, check out this. And he does the finger thing. <laughs> and then when they went to pour the water, suddenly it was wine. And it was the best wine that anyone had ever had. And they go, <laughs> Oh, that's pretty good, Jesus. But have you got any other miracles? And he says, yes. Come on, we're going to do a supper. Now, everyone <laughs> is gathered around, and this is the point at which Jesus reveals, by the way, one of you is very sus. I know one of you will betray me. And he looks at Judas, and Judas is kind of looking away. But then Da Vinci's like, guys, uh, I need you to stay uh, still for the painting. <laughs> So Jesus goes, watch this. And he takes some bread and wine and he says, look at this bread. This is my flesh. And everyone's kind of like, really? <laughs> and he goes, well, yeah, yeah. I mean, if you're Protestant, then just metaphorically. No, no, okay, look at this wine. It is my blood. Really? 
quit making this so complicated. Here, <laughs> have some. So he hands it to his disciples and they went, fantastic, I was peckish and thirsty. And he goes, yes, in fact, I shall call this little celebration communion. a Eucharist or Maybe. Holy yeah, Communion. It will be the practice of eating one cracker or piece of bread and drinking some wine. And if you eat the whole thing and drink the whole bottle, that's called a huge caress. <laughs> now, most Christians today take that as a symbolic thing, unless you are Catholic. Now, they believe in what's called transubstantiation, which means that the bread and wine literally turns into the body and blood of Jesus at the moment. Someone that grew up Catholic, I had no idea about this being completely honest. This is some next level stuff. ...moment that they are consumed. Okay. However, it does still look like bread and wine, and they call that phenomenon appearance uh -huh. or accident. It has changed, but you just can't tell. Except for sometimes when you actually can. Okay. Lanciano, Italy, in the 8th century, there is a monk and he has been on r slash atheism for far too long. He is starting to have doubts about the blood and wine stuff, but he still has his monkly responsibilities. So, he holds mass and he says the words of consecration, this is my body, this is my blood, this is my rifle, this is my gun. <laughs> Uh, uh, period correct no doubt 100 percent. oh my god this goes hard i just want to take a second to just to, to, to reach everyone out there right like ima imagine any other practice in which it is yes you are literally consuming the <laughs> flesh <laughs> of someone else <laughs> That's this isn't to poke fun. This isn't the, this isn't to poke fun. Just to rationalize that, like, damn, this do be metal AF. <laughs> and at that very moment, the bread turns into literal flesh in his hands, uh -huh. and the wine turned to blood. Jesus, man! Holy shit! Said everybody in unison. And ironically, he went, "Oh, well, I should probably not eat this then." Probably not. So instead, he kept it in this chalice thing. What is it? A clock? Anyway, there it remains still today, kept in the church of San Francesco. And now a couple of years later, in the 1970s, Professor Odaro Leone decides, let me do a bit of an experiment. So he took a sample of the flesh and he came to the conclusion that it was indeed real. I'm actually really interested to know how they allowed him to do that because that to me, at the very least, would seem like some kind of artifact or some kind of sacred relic in some capacity, right? Like, I'm actually rather surprised that they even let him deal with that. Apparently, it was part of a heart valve and that the blood type was AB. Okay. The sample has not been analyzed since. No. However, it is officially recognized by the Roman Catholic Church. Here ends the reading. Cool. Yeah, that's why I don't talk about religion a lot, because there is a lot to discuss, there's a lot to go over, and any time I say anything, it will feel like I, uh, like I will be treading on someone's toes. That is not my intent. This is why I don't talk about this a whole heck of a lot on here. Now you might say, wow, that section really doesn't have a whole lot to do with wine. And in fact, you're just badly retelling a Bible story. It's called the Bible. <laughs> This final section we started making for the main channel when we found this massive court document and we thought, holy shit, this is a hell of a story. Okay. And we had all these ideas of it being like Witcher themed, and so there were quite a few like random Witcher assets, just ignore that. But it just kept yeah. blooming and blooming into this bigger story and it got too long. And so here it is on Incognito. And here we begin in 1743. The birth of Thomas Jefferson. Push, Mrs. Jefferson, push. Now, Tom Jeff, yeah. he was involved with some politics, kind of sexy, but you're too late, he's dead. <laughs> but what's more important is he tried his hand at a lot of different hobbies. Okay. Architecture, he designed his own home in Monticello. He played the violin. He kept mockingbirds. He collected fossils. And, most relevant of all, he hoarded a culture. 
Nice. In his extensive garden, he kept 330 types of vegetables and 170 types of fruit. One of those fruits was grapes. Mm -hmm. So he tried his hand at viniculture. And while he was good at a lot of things, he never saw much success with making wine. Okay. So he mostly collected the stuff. Now, people naturally wondered, like, hey, what happened to the wine he made and the wine he collected? Did he sell it all? Did he give it away? Did he attempt the huge caress? <laughs> Fast forward, 1985. Meet German music producer Hardy Rodenstock. He is an avid wine collector. And he's tapping on the walls of old buildings in Paris, looking for some national treasures. <laughs> Why do I feel like this is... To be fair, it is also Paris. You have the catacombs underneath. Apparently, allegedly, potentially r slash never happened. You have entire like uh, catacomb raves and you have entire uh, home theater systems that get set up in the catacombs and like electricity gets run down to it. There's a lot of catacombs in Paris. This actually isn't as far fetched if this was true. On this occasion, the wall opened and my God. Sealed behind, he said that he found a collection of 24 bottles dating all the way back to the 1780s, and oh, look at that, THJ engraved right there on the glass, Thomas Jefferson. My God. It seems like Mr. Rodenstock has stumbled upon Jeff's hidden collection. Mystery solved. Or? And it would make sense that they wound up in France because Jefferson spent a number of years over there. Mm. Amazing. And into Rodenstock's wine collection, they went. Now, Rodenstock's wine collection was something quite special, and he liked to show it off. So every year he would host tasting events that featured extremely rare wines. And he would invite all the most prominent German celebrities, such as the Hans Brothers, and Das Boot, was. and <laughs> Death Stranding. <laughs> now, one of his guests was a guy named Michael Broadbent, the senior director for Christie's auction house. Mm -hmm. Together, they cracked open one of the THJ bottles. Bottle number one. Broadbent said that the wine was delicious. Yup, these bottles are in perfect condition, he said. You should really auction these things. I run an auction, you should put them in there. Uh -huh. huh. Maybe I should, said Mr. Rodenstock. Maybe I should. Well, and this is how business connections are for us. I was literally talking about Ruth Chris Steakhouse earlier today and how, yes, there are people that say they can make a better steak. As long as they have, like, prep time of a couple days, they could potentially make a steak that's better than Ruth Chris Steakhouse. But you pay for, one, the atmosphere. You pay to go there. You have a quality steak or quality dish on hand. And that's something that, like, if I were to, you know, have a business meeting with, say, like, on a corporate level or something, like someone I really wanted to impress, yeah, you... Hey, I need the money to do that. These are how business relationships are forged. Sometimes you just have to deal with enough money and enough of an entry fee, a barrier to entry, and have enough of a quality product to start forging relationships like these. These these things just happen. But before they did that, they sold two of the bottles privately. Number two and number three. Okay. And they drank a fourth. On the 5th of December, 1985, they put up bottle number five for auction at Christie's. It was bought by Christopher Forbes for £105,000, which at the time meant it was the most expensive bottle of wine ever sold. That, uh, here's the funny Kip line, that's back then money, that's more today. But that wine wasn't to drink. Probably no. that thing sat on the Forbes shelf. Yes. Eventually to be put into the Forbes gallery in the exhibit on former presidents. I was wondering about the correlation. And funnily Forbes. enough, they actually put this bottle on display under a big industrial light and it heated the thing something no! fierce. And the heat ruined its drinkability, of course. In fact, so intense was the light that the glass expanded and the cork fell into the bottle. No! Some time passed. They celebrated the sale with another drink. Bottle number six, now gone. And then they sold two more privately. In 1987, they drank bottle number 9. 1988, they drank bottle number 10. And at this point, a new challenger enters the sea. The White Wolf of Palm Beach. Uh? They call him Bill Coke. Some say it's short for billionaire. He's okay. a member of one of the wealthiest families in America. I've honestly never heard of them. 
I, I wonder I wonder what kind of meta commentary it is. It's some random on the internet using an anime avatar, using a V2 remodel. Never has never heard of this family. <laughs> is that a jab at me or is it a jab at them? <laughs> and he is also one of the world's most avid collectors of wine. Sure. So they sell him a total of four bottles. Got the money. For $311,804. We're way over here on the graph at this point. Yeah. So gently careful careful now he put them in his climate controlled cellar yeah. and he would show them off to his friends otherwise here they remained for the next 17 years uh -huh. as the years ticked by more bottles were sold and more bottles were consumed he kept mysteriously discovering more eventually up to a total of 24 <laughs> he just procures more <laughs> what's your source on that i don't know it's just, it's just got him until there were none left. Right. 2005. The four Coke bottles had sat around for a long time on the shelf. Uh-huh. Doing nothing. When something new happened. The Boston Museum of Fine Arts was interested in displaying the bottles and wanted to trace the exact provenance. Okay. Oh, no. So Coke gets on the line with the Jefferson Foundation and he goes, oh, look, I don't mean to brag, but I'm about to have my bottles displayed at the Boston Museum. But I need just a little bit of verification. Could you tell me exactly where these bottles come from? And the Thomas Jefferson Foundation responded, oh, I'm afraid we can't do that. We don't think they're real. <laughs> yeah. What? In fact, you're not the only person to call about this. What? What? Yes, it was in the 80s. A Mr. Broadbent, I believe, of Christie's Auction House called up trying to verify the bottles so that he could sell them. But oh, we looked no. through our comprehensive historical records and found no mention of these bottles. Uh huh. Here's a letter we sent saying that we couldn't verify them. And they're probably fake. I actually want to know. Wait, what does this say? This is actually, actually very much, very greatly interests me. Uh, just because we were unable to make a positive connection between the dates and the vintages of the wine found in those known to have been ordered and received by Jefferson, does not mean that we do not entertain the possibility that these bottles are still we his. We couldn't verify them. We would, of course, refrain from any final judgment until we had seen the engraving and the rest of the bottles and learned something of their pro. This this actually makes sense, though. This makes sense. It's not that they're saying that they are verifiably not the thing. However, there is a lack of evidence. And that being said, there's nothing technically saying that this could not be a off batch that Jefferson made and was just like, nah, F it. I guess I'll just give it to somebody as a gift. Hey, this is my attempt at doing this. You know, that kind of thing, like off the record kind of thing. It's like. How many of you in chat or in the SCA or in other organizations make like mead, right? You stick it in a cabinet under the sink and you just make mead, right? You just let it sit, do its thing, right? Do you necessarily keep record of it? That's what I'm trying to get across. So, but there would have to be, you, they'd be trying to look for some sort of paper trail. Like, oh, dear diary, Thomas Jefferson brought this fine vintage. And it, they don't have it. There is not enough definitive evidence to say one way or the other. And they're probably fake. But, 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 but he sold those bottles to me yeah oh no someone's about to get now, lost here back to 1776 now here's a thing you should know about jefferson let's just say if he was around today he would play a lot of factorio <laughs> he was you know i have the largest collection of funko pops in the world and that meant that his record keeping was very meticulous mm. all of his anime was ordered alphabetically and so too were all the things that he ever purchased right including wine so that's my story, Mr. Pepsi. And those bottles are probably fake. When that's actually very good to consider. That that is that would be a break from the norm then at that point. I can absolutely see how they're saying that this is potentially fake. Who cares about this? He hangs up the phone and hits speed dial on his pager or something, and he I need to assemble a team, a team of investigators. Mr. Rodenstock lived in Germany, so Coke's investigators scoured the countryside for clues. Okay. And eventually they found a lead. They managed to track down five German residents who claimed to have done engraving work for Rodenstock in the past. Oh, no. They said, hey, have you seen these bottles before? And they went, oh, yeah, we have. We did those. <laughs> and all five were certain that the THJ engravings were done by an electric power tool. Every one of these 24 bottles of Jefferson wine were fake. Big fat phonies. 
Wow, the long con on that. Holy crap. Allegedly, to the best we could surmise from the court documents and articles, so this investigation still could be ongoing. If that is true, that is rough. I do think that instead of this being a text point, however, and this is a critique that I will have with this video, this needed to be, rather than a quick fire bullet point as text, because a lot of people do listen to uh, YouTube, this should have been its own segment. Um, that, that's like, if you were to say, if I were to make a video, right. And I were to say something about hypothetically, um, uh, crypto zoo by Logan Paul, uh, was a, uh, complete and utter scam. And then, you know, something else came to light and it, it contradicted that prior statement, but I made it as a bullet point. What there there is a little bit of contention in the YouTube sphere is what I'm trying to get across in regards to stuff like this where important points are either uh, modified in post or they're left as a bullet point with very pertinent information to this. In this case specifically, because this is a all that isn't allegedly that these are fake because it seems like there is still information that is ongoing. Um, I think this would have been better as a talking point personally, but I can see why this would be relegated to a footnote. Allegedly, allegedly, allegedly. Yeah. So Bill takes all of this evidence to court and Rodenstock is summoned, but he doesn't show up. So Bill wins in absentia and yep. is awarded a million bucks. Wow. In the end, Bill never received any money from Rodenstock. But to Bill, it was about sending a message more than receiving any money. Yes. I'm coming after you. And it's just one battle of many that Bill has fought against counterfeit wine. Honestly, and I, I'm, it's not even that he's rich. It's not even that he's anybody. Whether you have two dimes to rub together, whether you have 10 bucks in your bank account, $200, get paid $800 biweekly, right? Up to this level. Look, if you're not, if you are getting hoodwinked, if you're getting sold a product that is not marketed as it should be, if you're getting sold counterfeits, if you're getting sold something that is fraudulent, I, I'm for these people being taken down. I am absolutely for the fight against it. It's not necessarily because this man apparently is rich. I literally didn't know of this man until this video. You know, it, it as somebody that has had to deal with fraud in finance, not being on the fraud team specifically, but fraud in finance, this is one the one thing that just kind of makes my blood boil a little bit is uh, counterfeits and frauds. It's a very profitable industry, but it's uh, it's definitely not the most ethical. In 2008, Coke filed a consumer fraud lawsuit against the Chicago Wine Company. Wow. Which was later settled out of court. Yeah. Another time, Coke spent $3.5 million buying nearly 2,700 bottles of wine from Zaki's auction house. Sure. Almost a third of a million dollars worth was fake. The auction house settled out of court, but the seller was told to pay $379,000 in damages and another $1,000 for every bottle. Wow. But then the next day they went, you know what, we thought about it. This jury has decided to award you $12 million in punitive damages. Wow. Jackpot, said Mr. Coke. I'm rich. But a year later. The and that is where being rich does have its, uh, have its privileges, though because there is the ability for lawsuits to be filed people and companies that will want to settle out of court as to not uh, have a wider brand image impact and uh, you know potentially even uh, mitigate certain damage to them this is where having money and having legal team would help in this and this is where a little bit of that unfairness has i'm against all counterfeits absolutely uh, i think that people trying to sell something that's not things being fraudulent fake absolutely you know deplorable that being said it there is a discrepancy between certain people like Mr. Cock in this opinion, being able to uh, enact action upon these companies and businesses, uh, individuals, and someone, you know, in my tax bracket <laughs> that doesn't have that ability. It needs to be fair. If you are selling a fraudulent counterfeit product or service, you should be held accountable regardless of whoever is, whoever is, uh, you know, verifiably, uh, throwing this at you saying hey we need to talk about this you, you need to settle this um and then that being said companies if you don't make enough they could honestly just like extend the court battle and just bleed you dry this is also a concern what changed its mind and awarded coke only seven hundred and eleven thousand dollars okay. okay so this guy's like a one-man army and he's going around trying to scare the shit out of anyone who's selling fake wine Good. oh you've got expensive rare wine do you uh yes yeah, I'll buy it then. Yeah, but no, yeah, I'll buy it. No, it's fine. It's genuine, is it? Yeah, you're saying it's genuine. Yeah, definitely. And then he goes and he inspects it, then finds it's fake, and then goes, yeah, I knew all along, stupid. Lawsuit, Lawsuit time. 
By doing this, yeah. he's very slowly cleaning up the market. Yeah. After all of these investigations, Bill has spent around $35 million tracking down fake wine. But by 2016, Coke was ready to lay down his weapons. He sold off a big chunk of his collection, and it sold for $22 million. Wow. Which means he likely did not break even. Oh. So consider giving to his GoFundMe. <laughs> Now, this is actually just a very small part of the story. This scandal ended up making such waves across the wine industry that they decided to make a movie about it. Huh. Based on the Benjamin Wallace book, The Billionaire's Vinegar. And it was set to star Brad Pitt. No, wait. Now it's Matthew McConaughey. <laughs> no, wait. It looks like it's cancelled. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Happens. Right. So it's why I honestly can't take Netflix seriously. The amount of project they're like, oh yeah, we were gonna do this, but yeah, we we didn't end up doing this, or someone ended up pulling out. I, I honestly can't take Netflix seriously <laughs> anymore. That is the video. Thanks for watching. Four more to go, but we've already started in on the regular type stuff. In case you don't love fancy. Okay, bye. And don't forget incognito.com/slash incognito. I mean, obviously, this goes. Uh, it is a uh, in the vacuum kind of thing with uh, with this man, this gentleman. I, I don't know what he runs, uh, what businesses he has hands in. I don't know much of his actions in a vacuum is strictly what I'm speaking to in regards to cleaning up a uh, market f uh, just rife with counterfeits and frauds. I do think that is noble. That being said, that is a action in a vacuum. I just want to clarify that. If you have not checked out Internet Historian, go check out Internet Historian and also his other channel, Incognito Mode. I'm sure most everyone here, if you're watching this reaction, has seen the original. And in case you haven't, you should definitely go check out the original as... These are honestly awesome. Um, I, this has been a little bit in the making. Uh, as this was a longer one. So uh, some of the longer ones I have to kind of set some time aside for. But I thought this was good. It covered a lot about alcohol. Covered a lot about uh, uh, some different subjects. A lot of period stuff that I absolutely love. As somebody that does SCA. And uh, I'm curious what your thoughts are down in the comments section. Let me know what your thoughts are. Let me know what your favorite alcohol is. Did you know about docking? I guess. <laughs> Let me know some cool uh, drinking facts. Let me know some cool, uh, some, cool, uh, some cool capsaicin facts. All that fun stuff. Uh, can you validate that uh, knowing medical person in your life, that, that dark humor just hits different. It's next level humor. Let me know, and I will see you all in the next one.